When I was 17, I left the Middle East and journeyed to Germany to begin my university education. Well, so far, so nearly normal. But what makes the story of this 17-year-old so interesting, so thrilling, so much worth sharing? Trying to interact with a new society requires a, an open newcomer who is tolerant of new experiences, but it also warrants an, a warm, welcoming and open society uh, without which this integration simply wouldn't work. Yet, even at today's modern age, new societies still assign roles to people based on its perception of their origin, religion, um, and people have to deal with these roles or paradigms or stereotypes, call them what they want. So what roles or paradigms did I have to deal with when I came to Germany? And how did I doubt them and dare to break them? Here's the first one. Life is too short to learn German. Well, if you want to settle in a society, you need to learn the language, right? I remember my very first days learning German. Broken sentences, wrong semantics and what have you. The picture of a friend uh, patting my back, blinking his eyes, going like, Deutsch ist schwer, German is hard, um, still circles in my mind. Perhaps the most known cliché about German is uh, how many articles a word can have, <laughs> um, making the task really challenging. <laughs> Months pass, actually, and I uh, keep on listening to Germans speak their language, thinking, I'm never going to make it, because you know, life is too short to learn German, or so as everyone has told me when I came here. Well, it turns out they weren't right at all. Language courses is what most of us aim, aim for when they, when they learn a new language. And I took a language course too, um, and it was indeed helpful. I had a good teacher, and that helps too. The key to understanding how to overcome a language hurdle, though, is perceiving language as an experience rather than a mere set of words that had to be memorized. So I decided to go out to the streets and interact with everyone I found in my way. So, you know, having a big mouth and interacting with every second person um, has proven to be an asset back then. I remember it didn't all go well for me. Um, I was once called by a pro local provider and they asked me if I want to subscribe to a mobile phone package. And of course I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, only to find out later that I'd been charged. So if ever in doubt, you know, a nine or a no is much better than a yeah or a yes, you know. <laughs> Just be conservative there. Football was quite interesting as well, you know, not only football, sports in general. So sp playing football at a local club indeed helped me find new friends and, um, uh, you know, uh, get a new and different perspective into the language, think on my feet. I also took up a job to work with children, and children are amazing language learning tools because you can make as many mistakes speaking to children, they correct you and laugh about it, and they also construct you know, funny sentences that you do not re really get from adults, like, look at him, he's picking his nose, or tit for tat, or whatever. So children are really useful if you want to learn a language. Another piece of advice, if you want to learn a language, go to the countryside or to small cities, not to big ones, because at the countryside, English is quite a rarity, and you have to speak uh, that certain language. Now that I've got the language in my pocket, um, I decided to study medicine, and there's a second paradigm. <laughs> you know, even if there's time to uh, learn German, there isn't really enough time to study medicine in German. Now, it's no secret that medicine is quite a lot to handle, and although most medical students are known to be party animals, they really take to the desks when exams loom. Um, at the beginning of my medical course, I had much trouble keeping up with the speed professors spoke with um, and uh, with the colloquial speech of my fellow students. Our first exam uh, was two weeks into the course, and it took me twice as long to prepare for as, you know, a normal native speaker. And um, having barely passed, I thought to myself, you know, you're never going to make it again because um, it's too hard, because... Um, uh, comparing yourself to native speakers, you find that you are at an inherent disadvantage. They have something you don't have at a level you're never going to attain. This feeling keeps on, you know, um, trying to take over you as you look around you and find, think everyone around you doubts your ability to excel just because, you know, you're not perfect enough when you speak the language or 
you came from the wrong part of the world. So my urge to prove those people wrong is what motivated me to work harder and harder. And um, I'm not being arrogant, but I ended up being at the top 3% of my class just because of this motivation, nothing else. And I think um, this is something to work with. So here's a piece of advice. Um, just because someone makes occasional grammar mistakes or speaks with a funny accent, that doesn't mean that they are dumb um, or incapable. Um, Non-native speakers take longer sometimes to understand something, but they're still smart people. So to the non-natives in here, if they ever doubt you, prove them wrong. Well, here's the third paradigm. You know, after you settle in and um, um, get the language and the exams passed, you really start thinking about the society around you and whether you're going to fit in or not. And I remember this sentence, uh, one of my teachers uh, back in Kuwait um, told me that when I popped in in school. And he said, they're never going to let you be one of them, you know, speaking about Germans. And I knew that he was wrong and I wanted to prove him wrong. I have to admit, I grew up in the Middle East as an outsider too. Um, I lived there for 17 years, but never really you know, felt that I'm part of them. So I decided to build on this experience and change it a little bit, change this mindset. And I decided to perceive what I found in common with my fellow Germans, uh, rather than the differences that, that tear us apart. One has to admit, differences do exist. I mean, ranging from um, how I would, um, you know, finger count or tie a knot to the fact that I don't, I mean, Christmas is for me just another day or um, the fact that, I mean, my abstinence from alcohol, for instance. Um, this rift between um, um, our cultures was still tolerated by Germans. I mean, thanks to them, I didn't have to stuff myself up with goose on Christmas Eve or tie my shoelaces the German way. So thank you very much for this society indeed. Being yourself is key here. If you like a certain aspect of our society, go ahead and take it up. I mean, in my case, it was uh, sauerkraut. But I mean, you can, you can find something that suits you. But the thing about societies is, you have to understand that in today's world, in today's globalized world, the mere fact of your person, what I mean is, doing things happen just because of who you are and not because of what your culture is. And this is really important. So when I looked at Germans around me and tried to perceive what's common between us, I found that my aspirations are the same. I mean, when you think about university or your career opportunities or how to make yourself happy, we all have comparable aspirations. And this really helped me try start to perceive colleagues around me in a less culturally biased manner. At that point, it wasn't me and them, it was us. It wasn't, it wasn't the case that I felt the, as the weaker side. It, we were all equal. I mean, and neither did anyone else. So at the end, we were all equal. So, I mean, I must admit, um, it, sometimes these differences, you know, uh, uh, try to put us off. So I was still not able to play beer pong with uh, alcohol-free beer. Uh, but I mean, if you think about this cake I got for my birthday party, um, this is a tiramisu that was made with uh, an alcohol-free part, actually, non-alcoholic, and one with alcohol. And it says Oba the right across right, but here it says Obacht, which in German means be careful. And here it says Da is Alk drin, which means <laughs> there is alcohol in there. So little things quite matter. Right, so here's the fourth paradigm. No one is interested in us anyway. Well, um, with the challenges I faced as an international student, I decided to set up an initiative um, aimed at, you know, um, empowering international students like me to assume their place in the student body and recruiting um, public interest for such a, uh, an initiative was quite tough. And it's a long shot indeed. And, being frustrated about that is indeed part of the process. I remember one of the f my friends going like, no one is interested in us anyway. Now, 
somehow she was right. We were quite surprised that the university like Heidelberg doesn't have an international day where uh, students come together and, 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 and showcase what they find unique about their culture. Um, and so we decided with a group of international students to organize one. And uh, students, international students really like that in the sense that they f felt valued by their university and the student body and really had the chance to show themselves, which was quite a good motivation. And as you can see, the turnout was quite good. So people do care and they're interested indeed. Here's the last paradigm. To err is human, but to fail is human too. Now, I've long thought that living in Europe protects me from much discrimination uh, because of the free world, be it uh, because of my race or uh, my passport. I would like to urge every third world citizen to remember, however, that there will be events in their life, even in Europe, that remind them that they are indeed different. Um, one example is me uh, applying for an Erasmus program at a um, European university. Now, I, as a student in Europe, thought it would just work fine. Got the spot, um, and I thought, I'm going to go there. You know, it was quite thrilling, only to find out that the university had turned me down because, you see, this university wouldn't take in international medical students, just European ones. So while I had to uh, stay home, all my friends were out on Erasmus, which was quite disappointing. Another example is, um, and I think third world citizens here would uh, uh, relate on how much we uh, enjoy traveling, you know, passport controls and check-ins at airports is quite a thrilling experience. And with my Syrian passport, I didn't really expect um, or experience something different. Now, there isn't this voice inside me going like, this is where doubting and daring doesn't really work, right? It's, it's the law, it's the structure you can't change. This is where failing is fine, because in reality, you haven't failed as a person, but rather the system has failed you. Now, I think life remains unfair, right? And we have to acknowledge this reality, work around it, and make the best out of our circumstances. But at the end, when I look at everything, I go like, I have so much more here, so much, compared to the, to the little more I could have had. So it's not the end of the world. The thing is, though, I think time has come for me to doubt yet again and there too. Because if you think about it, I didn't get to choose my eye color, and I'm not discriminated against because of it, so I shouldn't be discriminated against because of my passport either, because I didn't pick it. I mean, this society took me in, tolerated my religion and my origin, whatever you understand under that, and really aided me integrate. There was, I didn't have to change any of the differences I put between myself and the majority. There was neither coercion nor bullying. I almost had, almost always had equal opportunities and rarely felt discriminated against. So if you really think about it, um, in reality, this achievement of integrating the 17-year-old is indeed yours, not mine. Thank you very much.